and yeah, he has all these great friends that also live here. So, there's a lot of you. So, I'm going to talk a bit about my experience in being a marathon running in LA and Tanya Cole. I was never questions, immediate questions. Oh, okay. An ultramarathon, by most people's definition, an ultramarathon is anything longer than a marathon. A marathon is 42.195 kilometers, which is the distance from the sun. <laughs> which, is a bit, <laughs> which is the distance from some place in the UK along some pathway and finishes at a castle gate. That's the official marathon distance. Uh, to, to Originally, but they made the book, they, 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 they redefined it. You can read about it on, on Wikipedia. But, um, so 26.2 miles. So an, an ultra marathon is anything longer than that, but an ultra marathon, typically they're either 100 kilometers or 100 miles, which is 161.2 kilometers. I prefer a definition of ultramarathon um, that comes from one of the greatest runners of all time. His name is Yanis Kouros. He's from Greece. He, uh, he's one of the organizers of the Spartathlon. He holds the record for the Spartathlon um, race in Greece, which is 240 kilometers. Yeah. He was he was famous when he finished that race uh, about I think six hours before they expected anyone to humanly possibly finish. <laughs> it was, everyone was asleep. They they knew that you know, the winner would come through sometime mid morning. They they come in and set up the finish line and be ready in the times and and people were getting called at three o'clock in the morning. He's going to be finished in like one hour. Get to the finish line now and set it. <laughs> and then he finished in the dark. And that was just, it was, oh, I don't remember the time, but it was it was like 24 hours. It was it was ridiculous. I, I don't I don't know. He he holds the current record for running uh, the most distance in 24 hours. He ran 303 kilometers in 24 hours. <laughs> no other human has come. No other human has come within ten percent of that. No one's come within thirty kilometers. When was that? When was that? That was a, in an ultramarathon in Australia. It was a twenty-four hour race, probably around probably the late eighties, late nineteen eighties. Oh. So around maybe twenty-five to possibly a little bit longer years ago. When he used to run races. I mean, check out Giannis Kouros on Wikipedia. He a list of his accomplishments. Um, most of the ones they list uh, aren't less than a thousand kilometers of races. He, he just, he's phenomenal. He did six day races and he run over a thousand kilometers in six days. It was just impossibly unimaginable what he did. You don't need a car. No, you don't need a car. So his definition, he asked for us his definition of an ultra marathon is not by distance, but it's about going beyond the physical. So you, know, you can get so far just running on adrenaline and fitness and being headstrong, but at some point you fall to pieces <laughs> and you need to draw on something deeper. And he tends to tap into that a bit more easily than anybody else so, you know, that's ever been on the planet. <laughs> He's been lying, you know, Halfway through a hundred kilometer, a, 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 a one thousand kilometer race from Sydney to Melbourne in Australia, and he'd be, he'd be in his support vehicle, and he's just totally wiped out, and he can't even roll over. He's just completely exhausted, and he's, everyone's thinking that it's over. And they sort of said, "You don't get up and get going now. You're throwing the race and you're not going to win." You just got up and started running. <laughs> He talks about it, he doesn't know what it is, but there's something he just he can just go there and just and just ignore his body and just run. Wow. Yeah. I have to ask this, but what do you do when you run? What do you what do you do with your brain? Do you think about it? Doesn't it get bored? Or do you meditate or you just make your brain off? Boredom is a very difficult thing for an ultra marathon runner to deal with. You You've got boredom and you're trying to run for 24 hours or more, you're in trouble. <laughs> um, 
yeah, you can look at the trees. Sometimes it's meditation time for me. Growing a lot through ultra marathon running, just spending so much time alone with yourself in, in the wilderness. But you don't discuss anything, is it? All sorts of things. But it's more the sort of things that happen when I water fasted. By being well rested, all these thoughts come up. They're not, I'm not consciously going, oh, I need to, what, I need to you know, figure out what I'm going to do for shopping this afternoon, or I'm going to, um, you know, I need to get a new car, or I need to buy these presents for Christmas, or, or <laughs> things that are on people's minds generally. It's, it's just, things just come up like, Whatever it is, like things that give you pleasure in life, things that you really value, things maybe you don't value so much, but you still do, and invest a lot of time in, maybe, maybe you need to, just, just things come up, emotions come up, feelings, attachments, things come up and they you know, let them get processed, but there's nothing to kind of distract you from being present with them. But it's easy to run, you don't have to focus, focus on, on your legs, or... Um, early on, um, I was focusing on technique, like leaning forward, falling, falling forward, from, and just picking my feet up and running, being really efficient with my. And then I used to count my breaths. I used to count my cadence, but when my feet hit the ground, I'd have a watch that would be beep, 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 and beep, 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 beep. And every now and then I'd just turn it back on and just check I'm still um, consistent with that cadence. I used to do all sorts of things like that, but I don't need to now. Cause I'm, I know it's like when you first go 80, 10, 10, you learn how many calories do I need to eat? Because uh, you know, people don't know how many calories in a banana or a pea or blueberry. You have to learn these things just to get an idea. You need to get an idea of what satiates you by how much you need. You just have to learn the basics. And then, and then you can forget about it and just live. You just can go and eat and I know how many bananas make me satisfied. Or it's, and it's different, it's going to be different every, every time I eat. But I know when I feel satisfied, I know what it feels like. I know what's going to make me satisfied for another five hours or whatever, whatever it might be. And ultra marathon running is the same. Uh, a cool quote that uh, was in a movie that I saw uh, a few months ago called Running the Sahara. These three guys ran across the Sahara Desert. 5,000 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't get sick. They didn't pick the shortest distance either, they picked the longest possible path across the Sahara Desert. <laughs> corner to corner. And, and, they, and they were approaching a country that they weren't allowed to enter. And they had to reroute and go an extra many hundred kilometers to go to the next country where they were allowed to enter. It was just, it was, it was amazing. Um, there were landmines and all sorts of issues. It's a documentary movie, Running the Sahara. And they made a, a really cool quote that I'll always remember was that Ultra marathon, ultra marathon running is 90% mental, which kind of makes sense. 10% physical. Or, you know, but they said ultra marathons are 90% mental, and the other 10% is mental. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. When you watch this film, and then you see them all squabbling and bickering and arguing about things when they're going through low, low times, and they show all that, that really cool like, emotional side of the ultra marathon in that film. It's a really good documentary. I recommend watching it for anybody who can not run. I need a lot during the race. Uh, okay, so for example, let's talk about what works well. Um, my recent two recent successful races were, um, and they've all been successful recently. <laughs> but two recent, two most recent races would be in Thailand in May. I ran a 24-hour race that. Paul and Yulia, just so you can do the six hour race at the same time. I came second in that race, and in those 24 hours I ran 162.8 kilometers. So it's the first time I'd ever run more than 100 miles in 24 hours. That was cool. Yeah. There's a term, centurion, that they used for that. <laughs> I expect to do it again very soon, in November, and December. But, um, yeah, I, what I ate during those 24 hours, because Thailand is a really hot, humid environment, and I mean, I, I thought, am I going to be able to, to even run for 24 hours in this climate? I've, I've never, you know, run in Australia in the summer and in hot conditions, but Thailand is different. It's tropical, humid, and heat. Um, and literally, on the very last lap of that, that race, I had to stop and lie down in the shade because I, I, I didn't know if I was going to make the rest of the lap. I just, the sun was just hot and I finished at 2 p.m. So I had the second day from 7 a.m. through till 2 p.m. I was just in the sun. So it was, it was hard. But 
But I, what I ate in those 24 hours was 26 drinking coconuts. <laughs> just the water, not the fat. Um, which was amazing. The, you know, there's electrolytes mm -hmm. in that water. I've read, uh, I've never heard of any specific people telling me about it, but I've read that in the war periods they used coconut water um, intravenously to when people lose a lot of blood to it's very similar in many ways with the electrolyte composition. So you can help your body just fill up your blood volume and your body can start to do some more blood and get back to a healthy level again. So I drank 26 coconuts. I ate 13 mango, just you know, sort of size mango, and maybe half a kilo, maximum 500 grams mango. 13 of those, and I ate one papaya and two cucumbers. So that was it for the whole rest. I, don't, I haven't added up how many calories. Actually, I have added up how many calories that is, and it will be on my website, rawsyathletic.com, where I put up results. Um, but it's not quite there yet. It'll be up in a few weeks, I guess. In a few weeks. Water. Uh, and I drank water out of a cup in that race. I'm not really sure exactly how much I drank, but I did drink maybe um, maybe six liters of water. But the coconuts was a lot of water on its own, so I didn't really need to drink a lot. I did another race in Australia last November, which is an epic race for me. It's my favorite race. It's called the Great North Walk Hundreds. I've done it every year since it was first started in 2005. So every November I do that race, and that'll be my next major race after we stop Fruit Festival 50 kilometer. And that's uh, yeah, it's 175 kilometers. They call it a 100 mile race, but it's 105.9 miles, so I guess that makes it the longest 100 mile race. <laughs> so it's 175.3 kilometers. And every year since that first year I entered the 100 mile race, I never finished the 100 miles until last November. There was always a different reason every year why. And every year I, I finished at least 100 kilometers. Um, but there's just something would go wrong every year. The first, years I did that, the first year I did that, I was um, still eating cooked. Um, yeah, so I used that race as a benchmark year to year. So I can, that's the race I talked about. The first 100 kilometers of that race where I did you know, 22 hours and then I, then I, then I that was on a cooked vegan diet. And, um, I've been doing that for a few years at the same race time. You know, in 80, 10, 10, 80, 10, 10, raw vegan, 100% raw vegan, and, um, and then I was doing 19, 19 hours. So it took about two and a half hours just by the diet change, and getting a little bit more sleep as well. Like, I don't know that in that period. And then I water fasted and took another two and a half hours at that same race. So in two years, just through 80, 10, 10, getting enough sleep, and and water fasting and took five hours off my time, down to 16 and a half hours. So, but last year, I, when I finished that race in November, it was the first time I'd ever done an ultra marathon and finished thinking the food that I ate was perfect. It's, it's a hot race, it's just on the cusp of it's about two weeks before summer starts. It gets through some really hot valleys where in five fingers it's actually challenging to run on the road because they get really warm. And, and, I, and I find it difficult to cool in that particular 10 kilometer stretch where it's midday, it's a dusty road and you, there's no trees and you're just exposed and in, in a deep valley where the heat just gathers there and you, know, you feel the heat coming off the road off like it's by and I just can't cool down. And I couldn't walk through that through that even though I wanted to one year. I had to run because my feet were just burning. <laughs> anyway, so I finished that race. And what I ate over the 34 hours, 21 minutes that it took me to finish the race, I don't know, <laughs> um, was I ate 18 kilos of mango. <laughs> 18 kilograms of mango. They were really big mango, most of them were about, they were averaged about 800 grams each, some were a kilo each. But I'd have every four or five hours, I'd get to a checkpoint maybe every 25 to 30 kilometers. At the checkpoint, I could pick up more food, refill my water. I'd always I'd carry maybe three liters of water, two to three liters of water at a time. And you know, I'd pick up two mangoes and eat them, and, and take two more mangoes in the bag and then start running, and I'd eat those over the next half an hour. So I was having basically four mangoes around each checkpoint area. 
and there's six checkpoints to go through in that race, and seven just to finish. So I ate 18 kilos of mango, from which I got 14 <coughs> liters of water, just from mangoes alone. That's pretty cool. Getting so much water from your food means I didn't have to drink as much food, as much water as the other runners who were eating rice and you know, creamy rice and potatoes and whatever else they were eating. Some of them even have alcohol during the race and stop to cook up and meat. And it's, it's also cookers and I'm just <laughs> Amazing athlete, probably done more ultras than maybe almost anyone in Australia. Travels all around the world, does all the hardest ultras. But he walks them, most of them. Um, he runs a little bit if he has to make a cut off time, but he walks fast, really amazingly fast. And this, in this particular race, the Great North Hundred Institute, he, he walks up this steep hill um, that brings everyone to their knees pretty much, and he just walks past everyone. He's people have been running. Well, you know, half an hour ahead of him, he just catches them on the hill and just walks past them. <laughs> he's walking like he's walking downhill, he's just like, Phew. And, and then he gets to the top, stops and gets out his cooker and <laughs> <laughs> to celebrate and treat himself to something that, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, it's, it's nice. To have. So, I've seen people um, vomiting in races because they, they stop and have this, this guy. Um, Great friend of mine drinks alcohol and beer and wine at checkpoints and, and then he vomits through the whole race. He thinks it's just a digestive problem he has anyway. It's a funny world. So, you know what, in addition to the 80 kilos of mango, which gave me 40 litres of water. I also drank 10 litres of water. I had 24 litres of water in 24 hours, including from my food. So I was really well hydrated through the race. I had about two heads of celery through the race, which was really nice. It tasted really good. I just usually start with a couple of stalks of celery in my in my, in my like, lighter pants. And then you'll see on one of those stickers and business cards I have that it's celery and stuff. That celery stays fresh, it's easy to carry. Um, it's, it's really it's, it's lightweight, it's, no, it's not sliding you down in any way, and it's just delicious to have it when you want it. And I ate about, um, about 45 to 50 Kitarabi dates, they were pretty small, so about the equivalent of 25 Mitchell dates in that race. And, but I didn't eat any Mitchell dates unless I so I carry about a dozen medjool bags in my pouch and I would run, run and have a better checkpoint into mango, run with the other two mango with them and then I'd, then I'd hopefully run the rest of the checkpoint without eating anything else. But if I got, um, I just had a couple of dates or one time I had six dates and that, that got me to the next point comfortably and I had some mango. And dates are that way to carry as well so I've done races in the past you know, when I was figuring out all these things, how to, how to, what to race on, I carry. I remember one race I started was 90 kilometers. It's called the Poor Man's Comrades, uh, based on the Comrades Marathon in, in South Africa. That is 90 kilometers, where they they say they have up to 15,000 people do each year. And some years are bigger than others, but 15,000 is the, the highest number I've heard. Obviously, they're mostly locals, but people travel from all around the world to know that. And this is based on that because it's the um, same distance and it's similar in, in the hill changes. Um, Excuse me, how do you do it? They don't have that as prepared for you. In, you, you have yeah, so that race. In order to have them at, at the checkpoint. Yeah, so I have a support crew in that particular race. But in this race, the poor man's comrades, I don't have any support crew. It's self sufficient. So I have everything I need to eat for the 90. 92 kilometers, I have to carry from the start of the race. And that race takes me about 11 hours to do. And um, so it's a lot of food to carry. And I can't carry enough watermelon to get me through that race. It's too heavy to me. So often I use dried fruit, dried fruit, but then dried fruit doesn't digest so well. So something that used to work really well, but I just don't do anymore. And I'm not really sure why I don't get by. 
I used to make what I call data road. I'm sure we've all heard of it from the three week and Harley made it pretty popular, but it's people have been doing it for a long time before, before I were doing it. Um, but yeah, just dates and water, where you can add celery as well um, in, to, get, to add some minerals. So you're getting water, water sugar salt, as Harley would say, or water, or water fuel, replacement calories, and, and minerals. So yeah, during that race, I, there was one year where I just carried, I started the race with nine kilos of weight in my pack. And I'm trying to run, <laughs> 90 kilometers carrying. And as I, as I eat food, it gets lighter. And as I drink my water, it gets lighter. But then I fill up water again. And it's, it was too much. My, I was starting to get sore ankles, and I just had more weight than I didn't train in. So I was the shock to the body. Got about 30 kilometers in the race and then started suffering. I did finish it, but it was, it was tough. So it's really important to carry lightweight equipment. Yeah. So, you know, I wasn't much of a runner growing up. I this is back to the start of the talk. Um, so, <laughs> I wasn't much of a runner growing up. I I I'd run you know, a school cross country, maybe three k race, three kilometer race, and I'd be halfway through, having gone too fast, too early, and I'd be hunched over and red faced and had a lot of cramps or stitches in my side. And, and when, when you've you know, when you get tired, you start to roll your shoulders forward, then you're closing your lungs off, so then you can't breathe properly, and then just, and just be run walking, run walking to the finish line. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> so, I think kind of anyone can come from that. If I can do that from that to an ultra marathon in front of me, I think it's kind of within anybody's grasp to provide the right conditions for your body. I started when I was, when I, when I went vegan, when I was about 20, when I was 25. I started running about two or three times a week, running a 5k course near where I worked through a forest. And that was great. All this time I, I never considered myself a runner. It was, it was many years later before I thought of myself as a runner. And a couple of years later, like around 2000, 2003, I did a 35 km run through mountains. I'd read race reports by other people that had done it in previous years, and it really excited me. I read these race reports and it's just like, I've got to experience that. Like, that just sounds so amazing, running through nature and just the long distance further than I could, could have imagined. Uh, yeah, don't hurt. <laughs> no. No, let it get away. Very good. Be safe. So I ran this 35 kilometer race that finishes with an 8 kilometer climb. I'm not even in the flats during that, it's just it's crushing to finish that race. I finished that race just like, oh my gosh, stumbled over the finish line. And probably 10 minutes later I was thinking, what can I do next? <laughs> I guess it's kind of like what I hear about childhood. You say, never again, never again. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was kind of hooked from that. I really love just being in nature, just that exploring instinct, that going somewhere you haven't been before, being able to go from here to there, um, and not having fears about, especially in Australia, not having fears about getting bitten by poisonous snakes or spiders or <laughs> falling off a cliff and you know, running at night, or just whatever. People worry about a lot of things, and, and I find that that holds them back a lot in life, and it was holding me back in life until I allowed myself to do these things, because I really, had, it was uh, it was a big deal for me to allow myself to go on these races. Uh, and what if I die out there? And you know, what about my family? Or people, people missing me? People like, can I can I do this? Can I allow myself to be in this dangerous position? I really wanted to. <laughs> I really wanted to do it. I didn't think of it as dangerous so much, but I just felt like maybe it's not a good idea. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe it's a silly decision. But it was based on what I was thinking. Other people thought of me. Like, it was, it was all from my head. So it was self, self imposed limitation. But I felt like it was coming, it was imposed on me, but it wasn't, it was coming from me. And when I realised that, um, it was very liberating freeing when I entered these races. After the 35k race, I did a 100k race as a team. I'd never done a half marathon, I'd never done a marathon. <laughs> and didn't until several years later. 
So I did this 100k race, the Oxfam Trail Walker in, in Sydney, in Australia. That's a team of four you have to all stay together. So it's the challenge is keeping your weakest team member up front and helping you know, carry the pack or, or whatever it is. Whoever's having a weak moment, just make sure everyone's okay. Looking after their needs, making sure everyone's staying hydrated. I really enjoyed that race. It took me 24 hours, which was pretty slow for a 100k time, but it was my first one and, and I was really happy. Um, I think next year I did it in 19. 19 hours, so it's a big improvement. That first year I remember I, I tried, uh, I was still very new to all these ideas and I, I was before I'd gone 80, 10, 10. And I, uh, I remember taking this trail mix, you know, runners run on trail mix, they bring nuts and seeds and raisins and sultanas, all, all these things, dried fruits. And, and, and they have to have salt as well, because otherwise you're gonna get cramps. And, so I made, a, made up this mix of trail mix and then poured salt all over it. <laughs> 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 it was a bad idea. And then I'm out halfway through this race and, and I finally got to the checkpoint where, that, where I had that food ready and, and I'm really hungry and, and I was like... Uh, uh, salt out my nose. I just couldn't even eat the food. I couldn't get, I couldn't get enough salt off it that I, could, that I could actually eat it. So it was a disaster. Um, I have a question there. Yes. yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, when you are preparing or practicing in your daily life for a race, do you prepare with an intention to be prepared or you just like to go for a run and enjoy the run and run as much as you want and you do kind of the same thing when you go for a competition or do you set some kind of a goal? Yeah, um, I always have goals in mind. Mm -hmm. I'm not attached to goals. Mm -hmm. I, so it was um, really important part of my growth and development was letting go of expectations. Uh, very challenging to do when you, when you have lots of expectations. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like I've, been, I've done a good job of letting go of expectations. So I have goals, and if they turn out unreasonable, I just reset them. And if they turn out too easy, then I reset them to something harder. Um, so I try to set reasonable goals for myself and, and try to achieve them if I don't. I know I'm doing my best at it, so I'm not disappointed in so the only day. To you, it's not a whole emotional thing, actually, whatever you do. Um, so, sorry? It's not a, a whole emotional thing with the outcome of it all. But you understand no, because I don't, I don't experience all those like, ego, emotions, yeah, yeah, yeah. disappointment, and frustration. And, no. and I'm not, I've never, I've never been competitive. Mm -hmm. I, I like, like, I like, some of the qualities of being competitive, I'll like, I'll run next to somebody and try to you know, try to improve on my times, and, and it means something to me when I when I, but I'm not I'm not attached to the outcome, so I don't I'm never disappointed with my outcome. When I, when I, if I drop out of a race for some reason, I'm totally okay with that. But, um, as far as planning for races, I, I definitely plan for races. When you, when you have to do the mandatory gear, in most races you have to carry. Everything from a mobile phone. I don't even own. I've never owned a mobile phone, but I have to carry them in a lot of races that I do now. It's kind of crazy. I just borrow one from a friend and turn it off and just something like that. Yeah, planning is really important. Uh, I usually underestimate how long it takes to prepare for a race. Putting checkpoint bags together with food, change of socks, change you know, the Injinji five fingered socks over there. Um, I usually have spare pairs of those at each checkpoint because if I don't change my socks about every 30 kilometers or every five or six hours or so uh, then I can get blisters um, not because of being wet I can run through rivers and keep running and not get blisters in the fly finger shoes with the, the toe socks but if I get any grit any like sand river sand or dirt silt if I run through mud and the mud gets in, and that friction really combined with the moisture, mm -hmm. the moisture softens the skin and the friction rubs against it, and that's that really easy to get blisters. So if I ever run through mud, or, and I don't even know where that's going to be, then I'll change my socks as soon after that as I can, and then I can just keep running. But I've done races where I've had to tape my feet because it's just wet, but I was just wet for 20 hours or more. It's pretty challenging. So, all those races, that 100k race I did, that first 100k race I did, I, that's, that's kind of the example I talked about earlier where I was recovering like an old man, like swinging my legs out of the car and walking around 
for a week after the, after the race. But I still wanted to do the races. He, he decided all that. I just got so much enjoyment and felt so much freedom. Just filled so many needs that I felt really good by doing these races. I, I've experienced so many things from heat stroke, hitting the wall. I did a race once where I, I was still on a good vegan diet and I was um, expecting that there were bananas at the checkpoints. Because it said in the, in the race, on the race website, but when I got there, there were these little candy lollies, sugar, sugar sweets, yellow, that were shaped like a banana. <laughs> <laughs> in Australia, they call them banana lollies. I don't know what they call them elsewhere, but, so they, said, but they said bananas. <laughs> so, it's not bananas. And I don't eat stuff like that. I didn't eat stuff like that when I was at Phoenix. Um, so I just tried to do this marathon through mountains, just drinking water. And about 25 kilometers in, I just started getting heavy legs. And then over the next five kilometers, I just degraded to the point where every step I took, I wanted—I couldn't run anymore. I was up hill as well. Every step I took, I wanted to sit down. Every single step, there wasn't an exception. For 5K, every step was a strong urge to just sit down. But somehow I got through that. I kept walking. Um, when I looked down, I had blurred vision. When I looked straight ahead, it was clear. That was really scary. Um, but I got to this, I knew, I knew if I sat down there, there was no uh, I seeing on the so I was in trouble. So I kept going and got to the 30 kilometer checkpoint. And they gave me an orange out of their, some of their own lunchbox, because there was no food available at the checkpoint. One of the volunteers gave me an orange. I ate that. They put me in a space blanket, put me in the shade. Like, they, they were, I must look terrible. I'm really worried about me. I said, oh, that's okay. I'll the orange, and then I lay in the shade for 15 minutes, and then got up, and then ran like I was fresh, like I just started the race, and finished the last 12 k's, 12 kilometers, just running fine, like 5 million kilometers, or just from an orange. So that's hitting the wall, um, and bouncing back on this. Heat stroke, uh, in that great Mahal Hunters race, sometimes I've, I've experienced heat stroke, where I, you know, I, I usually don't have a shirt on, and just have running um, like lycra pants, so I can stuff celery. Dash the food and celery down. It's kind of, kind of cool. <laughs> maps. I need to stuff maps down there. Uh, I know whether this, uh, this, this spirit on five finger shoes, five and five finger, or even on five finger shoes with the toad socks. And I'll have a backpack on. It's like a camelback sort of pack. I usually have no shirt on. And I usually don't wear a hat either. And people say, oh, you're going to get burned, you're going to do it. But I'm usually the only person in the race that doesn't burn. They're putting sunscreen on all the time, worrying about all this stuff, and, and I've got no shirt on, no sunscreen, and I'm not burning because of what I eat. The antioxidants in the food make healthy oils in my skin, and the sunlight reacts with those oils and does all good things instead of creating skin cancer if you can buy them big. So, yeah, nature's design. But yeah, there was one year I, I didn't have a hat on, it was extremely hot, and I got heat stroke. And that was a particular year, it was the second year of that great North Auckland race. And two thirds of the race dropped out if you can them up from, from heat problems. There, I got to that checkpoint and there were just bodies lying everywhere like a war scene. They had ice in their groin and under their armpits. And it was really unbelievable. And I Running the checkpoint, looking at time, you think about all these other things, and you might forget something. And I forgot to refill my water, so my water ran out. And then, you know, and, uh, I ended up running for two hours, the last two hours to the next checkpoint with no water. And that was on that road. I was walking down a dusty, dusty dry road where it was really hot in the valley. Um, I had no water. <laughs> so I turned up the checkpoint. I saw these bodies everywhere, and I'm like. It's <laughs> water. <laughs> and I was thinking, am I going to really drop out here? I, 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 don't, I don't know, I couldn't think. I was just, and I kept, I, I stayed there for about 20 minutes with the ice on me and just lying there in the shade and drank as much water as I could. Cooled off a little bit, 
I still felt terrible. But I went out and then, and then there's this huge climb. This, this is the climb on the boat. This is me at the top. And, and that used to bring me to my knees. Uh, it's not so bad these days. But uh, climbing up there, I, I drank three liters of water in half an hour. I was so dehydrated. I hadn't peed for hours. And, and I'm going out there and I'm drinking water. I'm drinking water and my mouth is dry. Dry, dry, dry. Within 20 seconds of drinking my cousin of water. And I just couldn't seem to hydrate myself. And I'm wondering, I'm just struggling. I'm sort of going up this hill like really slow. It's a really huge effort. Just feeling heavy legs. And I knew it was because I was dehydrated. And I had water available, but I just didn't know whether I could keep moving. Because if I get too slow, then I don't make cut off times for the checkpoints, then I'm out of the race. So I cannot keep moving and hydrate myself from this really bad place. It took, about, it took me several hours before I was peeing again. I think I went for about five hours without peeing because I was drinking tons of water. But I made it, and I, um, I made it to about 120 kilometers that year into the race. Um, there was another year where I had heat stroke, um, and, and it resulted in me feeling nausea every time I ate and every time I drank, and it was just horrible, and I couldn't shake the nausea. And then later in the race, um, I was at about, from 100 and, from 100 and, from 106 kilometers in, in the race, I did about 30 kilometers of the race just drinking water. But, because I've been trying for hours to, to get food in and just maybe nauseous every time I ate. I thought, okay, I'll go for a period where I just don't eat, hopefully it'll kind of reset my digestion, and then I'll be able to eat again. And I did 30 k's without eating anything after already running for 20 hours, 22 hours, I don't know what it was. Um, and I was really shocked that I could go that far without eating because I had, I had food with me. But I thought I would have to eat out of necessity before. Um, then I, uh, the nausea just, it, it kind of wasn't as bad after I had that sort of fast during the race. <laughs> Interesting. I've fallen asleep in races while walking. Um, the, that same race again. There's a long come out of the mountains, and then there's a long 10k road that takes you to 100 kilometer checkpoint. And it's dark, and it's the middle of the night. And usually, I can't I can't manage to just run for 10k's at that point. I have to walk some sections a little bit. And it just, it's really boring, it's not changing scenery, there's no lights, no street lights, it's just, it's just long and dark and straight road. And so I'm going along there and I, and I just felt like I couldn't run at that point. I try to run, but then I don't take a few steps and I stop. I was really tired as well, I was really low in nerve energy, I hadn't had that much sleep in my full race. And I'd be walking along and I'd fall asleep, take a few steps diagonally off the road, into the long grass, and that would wake me up, and then I would walk back onto the road. <laughs> take a few more steps, fall asleep. <laughs> and I did that about 20 times in a row. And that's, you know, when you want to go to sleep, you know, <laughs> if someone keeps poking you, you get really annoyed, right? It's, it's not an easy thing to, to, to push through being so sleepy that you actually literally fall asleep. But that was really, um, and really deep, really deep to come keep it going. And then I got to a point where I just went, I can't keep doing this. It was just too much. I couldn't keep falling asleep, waking up, and it was just it was killing me. So I tried running again to make myself stay awake. And it worked. <laughs> And I was late and I had a checkpoint. But I've had falling asleep 20 times in a row, just giving me enough nerve energy. When you're sleeping, resting, and walking, you're accumulating more nerve energy than you're using. But when you're running, you're kind of blowing through nerve energy. But it's just amazing how much, how quickly you can recharge. And ultra marathons are kind of like that. If you get to a point where um, you think it's all over, it's all over. <laughs> the advice people give you in ultra marathons often, ultra marathon runners will often tell you if you feel like pulling out of a race like that, don't. <laughs> Ask yourself the same question an hour later do I really want to pull out of this race? <laughs> and if at that hour you can ask yourself the question, 
Yeah, I really think I should pull out of this race. Go for another hour. And then ask yourself, do I really want to pull out of this race? And if at that point, three times, it's okay. It's, it's you know, you can accept pulling out of the race. But <laughs> the low points in an ultra marathon can be really short lived. Even five minutes, I can be going through a tough slump where I'm feeling really slow and heavy and tired. And five minutes later, if something can change, I go get on a different trail, maybe have a downhill section, something changes. I don't know. It's maybe my body is processing some food that I need more, or whatever it is, that can dramatically change from a dire situation to a really positive situation. You can feel fresh again, just, just get some sugar in. Sometimes you don't realise why it is feeling low. I've learned in that particular race again to eat. Um, approach when I'm approaching one of the seven really huge climbs that they have. Maybe climb for 30 minutes. That was a horrible challenge. I eat in the 30 minutes before because I find when I do that, and it took me about six years to figure this out, when I do that, I have so much more energy going up the hill. Um, I used to think it was smart to eat while I was going up the hills because I'm walking up the hills usually and so I can get my backpack out and get food out and peel things and I'm just walking. But it takes more nerve energy and more energy to to walk up the hill than it does to run on the flat. Um, so and then to compete with muscles having wanting energy and then um, and then also digestion wanting energy because I'm eating food. It's a big conflict and it makes it very hard to climb up the hills. So I eat before I get on the hill, the food's already into my cells ready for use. And, and then I just kind of go up, and it's really easy. It just made such a dramatic change to, to doing the race. So, yeah, falling asleep while walking. That was interesting. And I never would have thought it was possible to fall asleep while running. But I did. <laughs> Three times in a row. <laughs> I was running along this boring trail, um, washing my headlamp, lighting the ground, watching the, you know, jumping out of sticks or whatever. And as I'm running at a reasonable pace, it's kind of a downhill slope, a gentle downhill. And then I suddenly realized that I wasn't looking at anything anymore <laughs> because my eyes were closed. <laughs> <laughs> and with that realization, I had a shot of adrenaline and, and I was awake. And probably just taking two or three steps, like a micro sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, use that expression yeah. like a micro sleep. And then I wake up and I'm still running. <laughs> <laughs> hadn't tripped, hadn't close to going. And then and then I pause, and then, I, and then the same realization happened again, and then I keep running, and then like a minute later I'm asleep again, and I just took a few steps. And it happened three times in a row, but then, I, then the trial changed, and I, and I kind of woke up. And then, uh, and then I got to a, a, a checkpoint with uh, an unmanned water station, and just put a big tank of water there, and you can fill up. It's midway between checkpoints, but it's water if you need it. And I needed water, so I, I got down there, and I start, I'm, I'm squatting down, and Got my camelback pouch off and, I'm, and there's a jug there, and so I fill the jug with water and then I'm pouring it into my camelback in a full squat position. And then I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> and the muscles had gone limp and both things were on the ground, but I hadn't spilled a drop of water, it was still there on an angle. And, and I woke up because another runner was coming up, with the light, the, the light was coming. And then I woke up and then poured the water. <laughs> And then on before the runner arrived. And, uh, and I was refreshed again because I just had a little nap, just a little micro sleep. Just maybe, maybe it was a couple of minutes, I had no idea how long I was asleep for. <laughs> I came up with a really cool technique uh, to deal with these issues. Because sometimes I just get to a point where I have to sleep. You know, there's no substitute for sleep. You can't just keep stimulating yourself sometimes. Sometimes you just have to take a few minutes. So I came up with the idea of sleep sliding. So I'd be in a squat position on the ground. And I'd be like this, so I'd still my backpack on. And I'm so tired, I'd fall asleep within seconds, like maybe you know, less than 30 seconds, I'd be asleep. If I lay down and slept, I'd sleep for hours. And nothing like my alarm would just be going beep, 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 and I'd probably still be asleep. But when I relax into the sleep, 
my muscles go to you know, <laughs> and you fall over. <laughs> that wakes you up. Yeah. Uh, Sleep's possibly a great idea. So you get maybe five minutes sleep, fall over. It's a bit of a startle when you fall. <laughs> 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 So basically, you know, 80 10 10, doing 80 10 10 and you know, natural hygiene, you know, lifestyle principles, you're pretty much running dramatically. I talked about it in my previous lecture about how fast recovery is, like, you know, almost instant recovery. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, the physiology just works so much better, so it's kind of no surprise that it comes a better. It's getting all the water, fuel, um, antioxidants, like just, just all the nutrients you need. I'm sure you've heard Doug talk about it a hundred times. Uh, yeah, so I was going to talk a little bit about um, five fingers. Oh, first, um, I, I've done a lot of strength training stuff in recent years. Um, you know, usually ultra marathon runners are pretty lean, stiff kind of creatures, and running burns fat. And so it's you know, every ultra I do, I lose like you know, three kilos or something. <laughs> Um, sometimes I've noticed my butt just feels different after a race. Great weight loss program, you know, wants to take a ultra marathon. But then I, you know, then I eat and, and, and get it all back because I'm not trying to lose weight. But uh, I find uh, doing strength training is a really good balance for ultra marathon running. Having, having more muscle, I can store more fuel. And having, because I used to be really strong, um, and this is lean muscle. <laughs> Uh, so I don't want to build a lot of bulk because it's too, it's too heavy for me to run with, but having a bit of muscle helps me run up mountains and, and just, there's definitely strength involved. It's beneficial to have strength. But yeah, so I got into barefoot running. Uh, it's definitely a big part of my, of influencing, influencing my running. Uh, fortunately, I got into five fingers when I started doing it. The first thing, the first time I ever read about barefoot running, I was working in Canberra in, in Australia in the middle of summer and, and I, was, I was so excited and I went out and ran barefoot and I ran on, on the road for like a few kilometres and then hit a trail and I was just starting to run on the trail and it felt amazing and I was like really excited about what I read all these people's stories and I was like, wow, that's amazing, I never thought of that. And um, so I was like, I'm going to start today. <laughs> and I got on the trail and I saw this crushed white, I don't know what sort of rock it was, but I'm running on that and it felt great still. And then I thought, let's check my feet. Okay. Yep, no problem. Keep running. And then I was like, just a few steps out. I was like, hang on. Brushed a little bit more dust off. And I had blood blisters. <laughs> here, 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 here. And all the way across there on both feet. And this was two days before I was doing that 12 hour rest that I mentioned in the previous lecture. And though I had blisters that were um, something like, I, at the start of that race, there were ultra marathon runners there, one guy Paul Everett run across Australia. They're looking at my feet and they're going, these are the worst blisters that I've ever seen. Um, but what I did, I, I've been reading a book by Dean Carnass as the ultra marathon man, and called himself, and ran in 50 states in the US, ran a marathon in 50 states in the US in 50 days in a row. Uh, and, <laughs> and the hardest part of that for him was travelling from state to state. <laughs> <laughs> but he, in his book, I read what he'd done in a race um, where they run up through snow and they get wet feet and people get really bad blisters. And what they do is they lance the blister from front to back so it's not, because uh, so, when you're running, you cut a blister across, it's going to open up every time you run. You cut front to back and then fill it with soup glue. Mm. It was it super, super glue, like um, I know a lot of gorilla glue. Oh, yeah. Super glue. Glue that just sticks and you can't. Because it's, it's, it's basically it's exactly the same ingredients as what's in surgical glue when they give you stitches and, and, and glue to hold it together. Or someone instead of stitches, they'll glue the glue together. So I actually got Dermabon, which is a surgical glue from a friend who's a physiotherapist, but it, it basically is super glue. And I cut the blisters open, got all the fluid out, and filled it, and they filled with water again straight away, but I got the fluid out and put glue inside. 
Yeah. Inside the Western. So I glued the, the hard skin that would turn into a Western and was going to come off eventually. I glued that back to the soft, sensitive skin underneath. And then I ran 94 kilometers in 12 hours. And they felt like, it still felt like a trauma site, like that was a hot spot. But it didn't, it was strong again. It didn't, wasn't rubbing, it wasn't causing any more problems. I didn't get sick from glue poisoning or anything. Um, it, was, it was really interesting. How do you get the out? Like, yeah. How do you get it out? Um, one month later.
get where they're going. There were a few issues with five fingers that I you can't do too much too soon. I can't do myself. I did get tendonitis in the top of my foot um, through running for two or three hours on concrete very early on. I could run for that time in shoes, but I wasn't my feet weren't ready. They weren't developed enough to be able to do it in five fingers at that time. And uh, I had to stop wearing fives, five fingers for a month before that tendonitis went away. I bruised my heels many times because they used to, they used to, they didn't have this model when I first got five fingers. They had much thinner bases. And um, this one has a rock deflection plate on the bottom. And the rock deflection plate has all this extra tread. These ones are actually designed for trail running. Spirit on model. Um, I'm not sponsored by, by five fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I really love them. I think they're fantastic. Um, yeah, just having no, no heel. Um, when you wear heel, Normal running shoes that encourage you to heel strike. And when you're heel striking, it's like it's like slamming the brakes on every step you're taking. And they say something like seven up to seven times your body weight of impact goes through your knees every time you hit the ground when you're heel striking. And it's no surprise people get knee injuries and problems all the time. So I think the whole cushion shoe thing is a bit of a. Uh, you know, it's, I don't think it's giving the benefits that they originally hoped because. They look at the numbers and people aren't getting less injuries now running in sports shoes than what they used to when they used to run tennis shoes that were just flat, done on poly shoes and things like that in the 70s and maybe 80s. Uh, another thing that can happen in five fingers is if you're running and maybe not paying great attention and catch your toe on, on a rock. This toe is separate and if you hit a rock, you hit a stone, that's the rock that's embedded in the ground, you're running, and that toe gets caught, and so it's nice rubber that lets you grip onto the rock and hold it. Hold on, then you can, you can bend your toe sideways, and you can sprain your toe, you can break the toe. It is possible to have sprained the toe early on when I was getting used to these, but I, I, I think I'm just more aware now, more, I pay more attention. Get a few injuries like that and <laughs> pay more attention. <laughs> the, the only things really to be careful of. The other thing that's interesting is when I run 100 miles and this through trails and lots of rocky trails, <coughs> almost like running along a tra train track sometimes on the rocks. It gets so much stimulation through feeling the ground for so long that it can become overstimulation. You can only tolerate so much stimulation. But I can, I can keep running through that, it's not a problem. It's just, it's just when you finish the race, you're like, oh my goodness, my feet <laughs> to rest. <laughs> There's something to recover from, so you know, just, it's just one of those things that just keeps building and you just really just want to just leave my feet alone for a minute. <laughs> Every checkpoint I get to, I take my shoes and socks off, um, I put new socks on, and that just really helps cool me down. It feels really good. Putting fresh socks on feels really good. So I recommend that if anyone does anything like this. Any ultras or long, you know, marathon or anything, even. I always carry a spare pair of socks if I don't need to change. So now I can run 100 miles um, in five fingers on road in 24 hours. I can run barefoot, completely barefoot, so six kilometers on concrete with no blisters in 30 minutes. So five minute pace, so fairly fast pace and still didn't get any blisters. And I can run, uh, I run track sessions in Australia with running coaches. And it was only through running with those running coaches that I ever thought of myself as a runner as well, because I was keeping up with all these people that I considered runners. I was like, wow, I'm one of them. But yeah, I did a, recently did a two hour session there, track session, totally barefoot because I forgot my shoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Driving up at training and I was like, oh, my shoes. <laughs> I forgot to get them out of the door. And I was like, oh, well, I'll do a barefoot. It's okay. <laughs> Every other time, Previously, I would have had blister problems, and, uh, especially seeing the track was raining. It was raining that day, and you hit the track and slide a few millimeters every step, um, and still I didn't get blisters. So I just think it's just a constant, steady progression of improving your range of the landing, just your muscles involved in your feet, and all the parts of your feet, and it's worth developing. It's got so many benefits. Basically, uh, to develop. You're running or any, any fitness activity, you want to overload your body with a reasonable challenge and then recover. And overload and recover. You don't have to be fully recovered before you train again. You have to recognize what state you're in. You're in a state of fatigue, 
And they're really, they're really training in a way that I refer to as active recovery rather than going all out and training hard. Yeah, train needs sleep repeat. It's a pretty good um, mantra to, to go by. Yeah, so I kind, of, I kind of, something I like about ultramarathon running is the challenges in my nature, in that, in that nature is challenging my nature. The two kind of gel well together, it helps me to explore the natural challenges out there, help me to explore myself. An ultramarathon running takes you into a really vulnerable place where you're really running down on so many levels. And so it's kind of sink or swim and you really sort of test what you're made of. And it can be really empowering if you can rise through that and succeed. Um, one of the beautiful things I love about combining the 80 10 lifestyle with ultramarathon running in the sense of ultramarathon running is that I'm always, I always feel race ready. If someone said, Grant, we're going to go to climb this mountain now, um, you know, in the dark, grab a headlamp, let's go, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't matter what, what I've been doing leading up to that. If I just trained or I'd be like, yeah, let's do it. Um, always race ready, it's a beautiful thing. I hope you can find similar successes in your life and you know your athletic um, passion, where your athletic passions lie. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is a sign up for becoming an ultra marathon runner. <laughs> Probably not a good salesman for making people with ultra marathon runners. <laughs> Yeah, it's difficult. Um, people get confused. They can be dehydrated, they can be hungry, they can be fatigued, they, they might have heat stroke, or they might lots of different things. And people just, or people can just think, I'm just tired. Um, like I could be going up one of those hills and not have eaten leading up to the hill. Going up the hill is going around well, really exhausted. So, you know, no kidding, I've been running for more than a day. I'm supposed to be tired. But no, maybe I just needed some water, maybe I just needed some food. So dehydrated, um, basically if you're not peeing, probably dehydrated. <laughs> if you're not peeing regularly, if you're not peeing clear, if you're peeing just with a lot of colour in it, then, then you're probably dehydrated. Generally, it's a little bit different with racing because I consume so many more fluids, but just day to day, if you're trying to work out if you're dehydrated or not. So what um, dog work uses at these events, like the water fasting events, if you're peeing 8 to 12 times a day, that's good. You're hydrated. And it should be, each time should be, have some sort of volume, not just like a trickle and a trickle of yellow and toilet doesn't count. Is this something in the face? Does the face see gross? Um, uh, maybe if you ask Carly, she'd say yeah. But I, I, I don't really notice, notice that so much. Um, I don't think, I don't think you can just look at someone and say they're dehydrated so much. Okay, that's it. Not in my experience. Maybe I'm just not sensitive to such things. Uh, yeah. I mean, in an ultramarathon, they, they often pay you at checkpoints. Uh, and if you lose more than a certain percentage of your body weight, they can pull you out of the race. Um, in other races, they'll just start questioning you and saying, uh, hey, you know, how, are you, how are you going? What's your name? You know, where do you live? What's your address? Or whatever. Just seeing that you're thinking clearly and, and if you're walking straight along. I don't know. Whatever it might be, just seeing that you're okay. And if they're happy that you're okay, they'll let you keep going, but if they're not, they'll, they'll just, you can't keep going in the race. So it's, it's interesting. So before races like that, I won't be before I get weighed. I'll get, I'll get weighed as light as I can and then feast. So that when I get weighed later on, it's not. Because if I eat a lot before a race and then get weighed, that, that food's going to get digested soon, I'm going to lose some water. And, I'm going to be on the lake for no good reason, and I'm still fine. Well, I would just ask you, uh, I personally, I can exercise and run only on that discount. As soon as I leave, I cannot exercise until that goes away. So what is it like? Because you have to eat and you have to keep running. 
Yeah, you have to you have to train. Like like one of my friends who swam 20 kilometers in open water, or like held a board next to him for five and a quarter hours. He had to train eating in the swimming pool. So he put food down the pool, he'd swim, 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 get to the end, eat some food, swim, 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 do a few more kilometers, eat some more food, and then train yourself. What do, you, what do you eat before you run or before you train? Nothing. I, I can only train or run on a stomach. As soon as I eat, two hours, uh, or I can train maybe. But what if you have one bite of banana? Yeah, yeah that, that's different. That's different. Yeah, that's is that an empty stomach or is that not an empty stomach? Almost empty stomach. Right, so that's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're eating in races, you eat as little yeah. as you can. Uh, yeah, you eat less, yeah. you don't, I don't sit down and have a meal. Oh, okay. okay. I'm having that's two right. mangoes and then I'm running mm -hmm. and then I have some two more mangoes and then. It's not no. a lot of food, so... Yes. There's nothing to keep you going there. But sometimes, in a race, if I'm self-supported, and like there's one race in the Blue Mountains in New South Wales, Australia, that it's Australia's toughest off-road marathon, we call it. It's 45 kilometers, a six-foot track, and it's a roller coaster. And, and there's no... there's no so You're in the middle of nowhere. You're going in here and out there, and in between, there's, there's no um, civilization. Um, so I've got to carry everything I need from the start, and and I do that race in both directions. So mm -hmm. the tall foot track, the six foot track, so it's ninety kilometers. And I'll eat a lot of food before I start the race because I don't want to carry it on my pack. And I'll start the race feeling uncomfortably hungry, un uncomfortably full. But I know in twenty minutes or whatever it's going to be fine. So I'll just start running a bit slower. And oh, okay. So you get to know your body and what works and what feels good. How much do you want? Like a week or so? Uh, most of my ultra marathon running, which has been the last nine years, I run about 25 to 30 kilometers a week. Which is nothing compared to what other ultra runners run. I kind of cheat because I eat healthy. <laughs> 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 So I just keep a base level of fitness. I don't care if I'm swimming or board paddling or walking up the mountain or running up the mountain or playing some sport with other friends or whatever it is. It's all fun. Um, even just doing strength training with, with Doug it keeps a base level of fitness for me. There's still a lot of cardio involved. And I, don't feel, I don't feel like I need to run a lot to be able to run. It's definitely. You just definitely develop your body to be able to run. It's definitely changes that happen. It's not just diet and I'm getting better at running partly because I'm running for more years and my body is adapting better to being a runner. Um, but I'm also using all the factors that help me to do that. Did you have a I did some burns in the big heights. Some burns in the big heights. You know what it's about? Yeah, there's less atmosphere when you're up high, when I'm in Costa Rica. Uh, I do a race that goes up to um, 3,020 meters altitude. It's a problem, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, thought I can burn quickly up there, so I take a hat. I have a, an Injiji hat that has a really long front nose on it, and it's, it's white, so it reflects the... And has the Oh, and if I, and I, I remember running up there one day and, and I actually was, my skin started getting a little bit pink. Um, but anywhere lower than I'm fine. Yeah, but up there, on the top of the mountains, it's, yeah, I thought it's, 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 it takes more attention over there. It takes more attention. Yeah. I, mean, I can definitely burn. If I'm in the tropics in like really solid heat, I can, in, in Vita, in Costa Rica, I can, I can burn in probably 40, 40 minutes. I go out at midday on the beach there and the sun is so hot. I can, I can burn probably 40 minutes. But in Australia, I, I, it gets really hot there too, but it's, it's nothing, nothing in comparison to I'm mean, almost anyone in Australia and not burn. Generally, it's possible to burn, but just kind of lay there yeah. um, in the hottest day for hours. Yeah. Um, Any other questions? Very much for your attention and awesome questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if people were still planning to go downstairs. Mm -hmm. oh, it looks lonely out there in the circle. They were playing out of music. Thank you for what's going on.